Hey guys, um, Andrew, co-founder. <laughs> yeah, Wednesday. Uh, and we're here to uh, talk about how we're leveraging uh, Aeron Cluster uh, in our implementation of a sequencer uh, for uh, digital asset trading. And here's the official slide. So I'm here basically to introduce us, and then our main man, uh, Wenza, is going to walk through some of the uh, implementation details, and then I'll outro, I'll outro us um, to uh, looking at how quant research teams can use the uh, Aeron sequencer. Um, but before then, uh, I'll quickly introduce um, IMIX. Uh, IMIX. IMIX's mission is to scale institutional digital asset trading. Uh, how do we do this? Well, we do this uh, via developing uh, high-performance trading infrastructure uh, at the core, uh, and this enables two specific product lines, the first one being uh, advanced execution, uh, and the second one being liquidity revision uh, type products. Um, and yeah, that's it from here. I'll, I'll let you go. It's available as a white label. Sorry, go back one. <laughs> On the right, uh, and that is essentially a schematic of of what the low latency uh, IMIX cloud platform provides. And so without further ado, I'll pass over to my esteemed colleague, Wenzo. Thank you very much. Um, I guess uh, before we dive into technical details, um, I'd like to share a few personal stories. Hopefully they'll demonstrate some you know, difficulties or challenges we're facing in terms of building a trading system. So, uh, 3 and support codes. I think um, if you are a software developer, especially if you are a software developer, Supporting um, and front office trading system at some point in your life, you will get that. Um, I guess I was particularly unlucky the night before my son was born. Uh, I was waiting in the hospital, you know, obviously emotionally, and the support call came wrong. And obviously, it was it was not a fun experience to debug a production system over the phone in the hospital, waiting for your son to be born. Right? <laughs> I was doing a lot of market making, and from time to time. Um, I uh, receive a lot of complaint and query from the trader. Um, you know, some orders just not behave as expected. Right? It could be a pricing problem, it could be the timing problem, it could be, you know, we completely missing the hedging orders, basically have PML impact. So uh, you can't just go back and say, oh, try, bad luck, try harder next time. You have to find out um, what, what happens. And in that scenario, it was actually very difficult to find out because lots of things can happen, can happen right? It could be configuration problem, it could be a risk limit, it could be the algo itself has a problem. Um, over the year, I was, you know, I've been working with Quant researchers, and this by far is the most common complaint I, I heard over of, of, of the times. So hopefully at the end of the presentation, we can share some um, examples, potentially how we can help in this situation. So um, we are in a crypto trading space. So um, what the unique challenge in crypto trading? Um, top of the list is 24-7. By 24-7, we really mean 24-7. Um, we trade on Sunday, Saturday, Christmas, Chinese New Year. Uh, you know, uh, so it's kind of a, a very different um, tactical design requirements. If you can um, you know, shut down your system daily or weekly, or you cannot shut down the system at all. And crypto market is very fragmented. What I mean by that is a lot of exchange, a lot of trading venues, a lot of liquidity providers and they're all located in different locations. That means there are a lot of inefficiency in the market. And it was also fast, very fast moving as well. So basically when we're talking about onboard new features, it's a matter of days, no matter of weeks. So they require very, very fast development time. And it's primarily on cloud. Um, so basically what it means is you have less stable environment, you have less predictable latency. So speaking of latency, we want to be absolutely clear um, we're targeting you know, microseconds, not nanoseconds, right? not milliseconds, and definitely not seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so, nice. uh, um, so what we have, have done, so we built a sequencer by using Aeron cluster. Right, so um, just a little bit recap on you know, what is sequencer. That's, um, uh, it's actually a very simple concept. That's, um, you have unsequenced input from your distributed system, from your microservice, from multiple applications. Then there's a guy sitting in the middle, it's basically sequence everything. Then you have a, a sequence of this is how you manage the global total orders. Um, conceptually, it's actually very, very simple, but implementation, that uh, could be quite challenging. So um, by leverage Aaron cluster, we think we have, uh, we can achieve those features, um, and fault tolerance, um, fully deterministic, um, you know, still maintain a high throughput, and not give up too much on the latency part. So how does it work? You have a couple of holes, 
and then you deploy it, um, the Aaron cluster, which is sequencer here, uh, one of the node becomes the leader, right? And then uh, you deploy your applications. Um, the sequencer itself uh, has session management. You basically manage the client sessions. You will notify the clients. Now you become active, now you become passive. Right? All the clients um, will contribute um, um, by the uh, cluster ingress. Um, the cool part here is because the uh, data consistency is already guaranteed by the Aaron cluster. So uh, and the sequencer will pick up the message, validate them, then you'll, you will egress them into a local archive. Because data consistency is already guaranteed, we can always replay from the local copy of the archive. And so we don't need to always consume um, the egress message from the leader. We also support remote um, and, you know, uh, clients. Basically, if your clients that, that deploy on a remote host, meaning that um, the host is not collocated with one of the sequencer nodes, um, what it does is the client will actually send a request for replay. The leader of sequencer will basically pick it up and, and do the UDP replay. So what happens if something goes wrong? Right, so um, um, say for example, if a leader fails, you know, out of blue, your leader fails um, from no zero to no one. And um, in this case, that the first thing that the client that running on the same host of the, uh, you know, uh, the, the problematic cluster nodes will stop replaying. And it's also well documented uh, as a part of the RAP protocols. During leadership elections, there could be data loss. So how do we prevent actually data loss? So in this case, that we have this kind of sort of priming logic. Basically, the client will send a message with a basic query to the sequencer, basically querying what is the last seen message you have seen from me. So for example, I publish 10 messages, the sequencer only see nine messages. That means you have one message lost. In that case, you need to resend that message. And then the rest is just, you know, similar. You send a request for replay, and the leader of the sequencer will replay for you. So what happens if client actually fell over? Right? In this case, it's much more uh, simpler. That, um, say, for example, your client 2 fell over from node 1 to node 2. And because sequencer uh, has session management code, so basically um, and it, will, it will be notified and on the callback, like a session close. And then you will basically tell, OK, now you are, you are the active nodes on the client side. Right. And then because you know, by leveraging our own cluster, it's relatively simple, well, relatively simple to write your system to be fully deterministic. Uh, given that our system is fully deterministic, so it's relatively simple to find out what happens um, is during trading. So you can simply replay, right? So, um, you know, say, let's say that you suspect that time five, that your order uh, has problems, you can replay locally, um, you know, market data update, config update, signal update, then you pull a debugger in your local IntelliJ, you can see the full state of system, and it's very easy to find out what happens. You can also um, replay multiple applications together. Say, for example, if I want to and find out my risk before and after I send the order. I can replay the strategy server and the risk engine together. I put the two debuggers and, and in, 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 the, in the point that I, I introduced. So what have we achieved? Well, this little tables, why we choose um, cluster-based sequencer rather than the traditional primary and, and standby or we call it this way, active or passive sequencer. Um, and well, the cluster base, you can pretty much take all the boxes, but uh, uh, and just two points that I want to emphasize, right? So theoretically, you can achieve uh, low latency um, by using the primary and, and standby setups. Um, um, but the caveat is because we on clouds, right? You have this kind of less predictable latency, and, and you, you basically latency profile is kind of variables. And so you, don't, you might not have the edge that you think you have. And, and the, the second point is, and throughputs, and because the possibility of data loss, and the most of the common design for the active passive or the primary standby sequencer is adapting um, the concept one in flight. Basically, you will ever send one message at a time. Um, and well, so if something goes wrong, you'll ever lose only one message. That's the concept. Um, but that has the limitation on throughputs. And so to some benchmark, right, so uh, I don't want to spend too much time on these uh, sessions. Uh, we follow basically the Aaron benchmark guidance uh, quite closely. Um, and this is three node um, benchmark on GCP, um, um, on quite um, you know, um, 22 port um, machines. Um, I'm sorry for that. 
uh, and it's quite small, so, and you can't see basically that um, we, we we basically you know uh, following the same guidance of Aaron benchmark, we use 32 byte, 288 bytes. For 32 byte um, on three node sequencer, one million message per second throughput. By the way, the definition of throughput is the same as Aaron definition. Uh, at 99 percent out, the latency less than one milliseconds. That's the also some you know single node. Um, sequence of benchmark, just disclaimer, right? This is the IPC setup on single node uh, sequence, single node cluster, basically running on the same machine, and everything on IPC, right? So uh, uh, this is by no means any fair comparison with anything, right? But um, because we build on top of errands, we know errands fast, right? We want to be uh, make sure that our business code is also fast. Uh, this is basically testing our internal logic, so uh, basically showing that we are not doing something crazy, um, you know. Slow everything down. Um, yeah, so this is pretty much it. So um, I will hand over to Andrew to talk about some real business yeah. use cases. So we're going to end on how quant research teams might look at a sequencer and why the sequencer architecture uh, lends itself particularly well uh, to uh, quant research teams. Firstly, um, we have feature commoditization and real time experimentation. So, as quant research teams, we want to be able to iterate fast, we want to be able to deploy models in real time uh, throughout the day, uh, and we want to be able to observe how the underlying market dynamics are evolving uh, given uh, financial markets are partially observed Markov uh, decision um, uh, chains. Um, we want to be able to deploy research as and when we see uh, fit um, as proper opportunities come up. So one of the main uh, benefits of obviously having determinism uh, in the sequencer uh, setup is that we can reproduce offline research pretty much exactly and fair, um, without too much trouble uh, into production uh, with ease. And so we've got an example here um, based on uh, feature uh, graphs. And so at MX, we, we basically like to commoditize the um, uh, research um, sort of infrastructure and expressions. Uh, so we typically see feature graphs and, and model graphs as computational graphs so we can express our, our research ideas in this way. Um, and so as you can see on the schematic, uh, we've got a very high level um, representation of a RAF cluster. Um, and then we've got uh, different gateways. So we've got news gateways, risk book, uh, Binance uh, gateway. Uh, so we've got market data coming in, so on and so forth. And so these raw features are coming into the sequence uh, stream. Uh, it's been consolidated. Uh, and then different feature graphs can pick, pick up models. So if we uh, sort of narrow in on feature graph one, we've got a Bitcoin big quantity and a Bitcoin ask quantity, uh, so on and so forth. They go in, uh, they will run an inference uh, on different uh, transformation nodes uh, in the graph, uh, and then a feature will uh, essentially be emitted out of that uh, and pop back into the, the sequence stream. Feature graph two can then be chained to that uh, and essentially bring in um, uh, all kinds of different features uh, and exotic features um, into, into the second graph, which then ultimately feeds the model. Um, so what's quite interesting about this is you can keep adding uh, different types of features, experimentation uh, on your features um, to, to ultimately arrive at the uh, most powerful uh, configuration uh, for your model. Uh, the second interesting point is the real-time experimentation. Um, so as you deploy things like neural networks or, or different types of uh, machine learning um, architectures um, into your trading uh, workflows, uh, typically, you want to monitor um, deeper layers um, within these networks to search for things like concept drift. And often, the overheads on uh, this type of monitoring uh, come with performance uh, impact. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to essentially um, monitor a replica model in the research gateway. Uh, we get to see the golden source of truth, uh, which is that sequence stream, the same stream that production uh, models are operating off. Uh, except we can uh, do more advanced things, uh, a more interesting uh, analysis that might have performance overhead, but ultimately don't affect our trading uh, decisions. So these are two interesting ones. And of course, this generalizes up uh, to model coordination. Uh, so typically, when we're looking at constructing uh, agent-based uh, market-making models, for example, we'll have local market makers and then a global um, portfolio-based um, market maker that's controlling the, the deltas um, uh, for each local one. And so here you can see that we're leveraging um, the uh, sequence stream uh, to be able to uh, pump information and talk uh, and have models essentially talk to each other uh, across this stream. Uh, so if we take this example here, uh, you can see we've got our feature graph, of course, emitting into the 
sequence stream, uh, but we've also got our predictive model, uh, and then we've got our agent model, which is the one in green. So the typical setup for a reinforcement learning-based market model um, in the state space, which is uh, essentially the inputs, is you have external context, internal context, and predictive context, uh, which is ultimately the headlights on, on your car. Um, here, uh, it um, informs the, the agent of uh, short-term state uh, evolution. Um, and so the external context, uh, colored in red, is uh, essentially things like the uh, market dynamics, the, the Q position uh, evolution, spreads and volatility, uh, so these types of features. Uh, you also have internal context, uh, so where are my deltas across the exchange, where are my balances, um, and what type of risk budgets have I been allocated, uh, and am I breaching them? Um, and then you've got your predictive context, and that's typically short-term state predictions. It could be anything around volatility, it could be around um, order book uh, evolution, uh, and so, so on and so forth. So this market-making model will spit out uh, actions or orders um, in, in the setup, and these orders will flow down to the, or be routed down either to an algo container that can then do additional processing, uh, or straight to your trading adapters, uh, uh, at which point they're placed uh, onto the wire uh, and trades are made. Um, so yeah, uh, just to highlight um, the, the points from a quant research uh, team uh, is continuous iteration. Uh, the zero time, downtime um, hot upgrades are particularly uh, useful. Um, and the, the cluster uh, sort of con uh, construct here uh, lends itself very nicely to that. Uh, you've got the coordination and consolidation um, of information. Um, so observability um, is a, a huge advantage here. Um, and of course, the loose decoupling uh, of applications allows the multidisciplinary teams uh, to search for uh, rich, uh, rich universe of ideas, uh, which can then be deployed in production. Uh, so these are just some of the advantages of a cluster-based sequencer system. And we end here with a small reinforcement learning man interacting with the world. Thank you very much.